Um, if you guys are comfortable with it, if you guys just want to give like a little clap for the time of worship, like that was very nice and very good. Um, so my name is Aaron. I pastor a small bilingual church over in Woodland, California, and it's very good to be with you guys here today. Um, I met Exter several years ago over at Western Seminary and was able to kind of connect with him and get along with him. Um, I have more of a counseling background, and Exter had some counseling things, so we just we bonded very well together. Um, I'm not going to be doing sign language today. I am sorry about that, but I am a little handsy when I preach, so maybe it will feel a little familiar for some of you guys. Um, but no, I feel very comfortable. I have a few like small connections here. Mr. Winstead is my son's band teacher, and so we have that sort of connection with the church, which is very nice. Um, and another gentleman, I think Brian with the I, is it with the I, is that right? Um, he was the chaperone on my son's um, band trip with Mr. Winstead, too. So a uh, little, little familiar with, with here. And yeah, just very grateful to be here with you guys this morning. I've been looking forward to it. Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 1. We'll be in verses 3 through 14 this morning. And we're going to be focusing in on what I'll call gospel-centered prayer. We're going to look at gospel-centered prayer. Now, a few months ago, my wife and I, we had the privilege of going to Madrid, Spain. It was a very nice trip, like one of our first trips without kids, and so it was very refreshing and very rejuvenating and very nice. Um, but one of the things that happens when you get to a foreign country, especially right in Madrid, it's a very busy city, um, it can be a little bit disorienting. You're not quite sure like where everything is and how to get around and all of those different things. And sometimes I feel like prayer can feel a little disorienting. It's like, oh, we should do it, but I'm not exactly always quite sure how to do it and what that looks like. And so one of the first things that we did, I don't know if you've ever traveled to uh, another country, but lots of times there are these guidebooks. Have you ever seen these like international guidebooks? Usually they're like blue and yellow on the cover. Um, and one of the first things that we did was listen to a Rick Steves walking tour. And the beautiful thing about that is in the middle of Madrid, this very big city that felt very disorienting, after about an hour of just kind of walking around, him pointing out the different sites, kind of telling the history about it, all of a sudden I felt very comfortable and felt very at peace in this place that was a little bit overwhelming. And so I'm hoping that this morning, Paul and Timothy, who are the authors of the letter to the Colossians, will actually just kind of guide us into prayer and guide us into feeling more comfortable with prayer, guide us into desiring to pray more. And so if you will, go ahead and open up. Like I said, we'll be in Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. If you have another version, that's okay. Um, um, just read along with me, and uh, we'll go ahead and go into Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. It says this, We, talking about Paul and Timothy, always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. The very first thing that we are going to see here this morning is that gospel-centered prayer includes gospel-centered prayer includes gratitude. Gospel-centered prayer includes gratitude. Notice that it says we talking about Paul and Timothy always thank God. It says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is more than just a nice introduction that Paul and Timothy are giving to the Colossian church. Actually, there was lots of false teaching that was happening um, in the city of Colossae. Uh, the Colossian church is about 100 miles inland east of Ephesus. And so it was a very strategic point on a very important trade route. So they would get lots of ideas coming in from Ephesus, and they would also get lots of ideas coming in from Asia and from the east as well. 
Um, and so what they're doing here is setting this sort of strong foundation that God is the father of Jesus. And one of the other things that happens here is you'll notice that it says, we always think, and then it will point out when we pray for you. When we pray for you. Now, it's a very simple point of application for us this morning, but my question for you is this. When is your when? When do you pray? I think a lot of us think it's like a nice idea to pray. That sounds good to pray. I should pray. But when is your time of prayer? Now, you may have been a Christian for a long time. Some people have very steady rhythms of prayer. Some people wake up early in the morning and pray. Some people pray well at night. Um, throughout church history, there's been something developed called the daily office of prayer. So usually it's this time in the middle of the day to, to take away to pray. Um, but my question for you this morning is just, when do you pray? And if you don't have a set time or a specific time, I would challenge you this morning to prioritize prayer in your life. I've been convicted a lot lately that I need to prioritize prayer much, much more in my life. Um, to have a deep and abiding relationship with God through prayer. And it's available to us, and I think many of us mean to pray, and it sounds nice, but we have to be very specific about when we pray, how we pray. We must prioritize prayer in our lives. Prayer often doesn't just happen. Um, so when is your when? Now, Paul and Timothy are very intentional in their prayers for the church. And notice that the primary thing that they are thankful for in verse 4, it says, since we heard of your faith. They're thankful that they heard of the Colossian church's faith. If you don't feel like you have something to be grateful for or a reason for gratitude, just think back to the times that Jesus has saved you. The fact that Jesus Christ, if you are a Christian, you always have a reason to be thankful. Amen. That God actually saved you through his atoning sacrifice for your sins on the cross. And it's in Christ, in Christ alone, that you are saved. And that is enough reason to give thanks to God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Um, notice, we'll go ahead and continue on. Actually, here in just a second, sorry. Um, in verse 5, Paul and Timothy will talk about the true message of the gospel. And one of the things that they are thankful for in the Colossian church is that the people in the Colossian church had actually trusted initially and exclusively in Jesus Christ for their salvation. Um, and I love that 2 Corinthians 9.15 actually describes salvation as this indescribable gift. An indescribable gift. Um, and I love that. I love that. Uh, we're going to go ahead and keep reading, though, in verse 5. So... We'll go ahead and read in Colossians 1, verse 5, and it says this. Because of the hope, whoops, sorry. Because of the hope for you in heaven, of this you have heard before the word of truth, the gospel, the gospel. The next thing that we're going to see here is that prayer includes truth. Gospel-centered prayer includes truth. Now, it initially starts talking about hope, and hope here is much more than just an optimistic attitude. The hope that he is referring to is a real hope, a very grounded hope, a hope that is found in Christ, in Christ alone. In verse 127 in Colossians, it says that, the hope of glory is Christ in you. And Hebrews 6, 19 through 20, it actually says that hope is the foundational anchor for your soul. And that through hope, God actually supplies his people with joy and peace as we trust in him, according to Romans 5, 13. And it's because of our hope in Christ 
we can live with confidence and contentment that the only hope that you will always and ever need is Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, it's interesting here, they refer to this as the word of truth in verse 5. And this is a very interesting phrase that he uses here, because later on in chapter 1, uh, Paul and Timothy are going to exalt Christ as being supreme and above every power and authority on this earth. And one of the sort of heresies, one of the false teachings that was creeping into the church at that time was that God and Jesus, they were just one of many gods available to you to choose from. It's just one way to God and not the exclusive way to God. And so what was happening is a lot of the Christians were actually becoming confused by this sort of teaching. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen, uh, there's these bumper stickers on the back of cars. They're called Coexist. Have you seen these bumper stickers? So it will have like a Jewish star, a crescent, a cross, all sorts of things. And usually kind of the message is, why can't we just all live in peace? There's multiple ways to get to God. And so one of the things I love about what Paul and Timothy are writing, they're writing to a church almost 2,000 years ago, and that same sort of message is still critical for us as Christians today. That God is not one of many, but he is the one and only. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And this is the hope that we have in Jesus, this true message that was given to the Colossian church. And any time that someone will say, you, you will hear this in churches. Churches and Christians are kind of weird sometimes. I don't know if you've noticed this. Um, but sometimes you'll, you'll go to a church and they'll be like, we preach the true gospel. We are the only ones who preach the true gospel. And, and they may preach the true gospel, that's true. Um, but true gospel must have the elements of the grace of God with inside of the message. It must have the grace of God because it is by faith alone in Christ alone through the grace of God alone. Um, and there are many churches, I, I won't name any specific names, but there, there are some churches in, I think, Woodland and also in Davis that kind of start falling into this um, category of more of like working to earn your salvation. Like the gospel was good enough to save you, but it wasn't like good enough to keep you. And so now you have to like kind of work harder to earn more favor or more merit or more salvation with Christ. And that, quite frankly, is a little ridiculous. <laughs> um, Paul has some harsh words for this. In Galatians 1, 7, he calls this type of works-based salvation a no gospel at all. So it's possible to be in a church that says we preach the true gospel, and yet they've actually missed the true gospel. And Paul would say that's actually not a gospel church. Um, so it's very interesting. We must keep grace central at the gospel message, that it cannot be earned. Jesus' salvation, his substitutionary atonement, his dying on the cross in our place, it can never be earned, and it's always completely undeserved on our part. The true message of the gospel of God's grace was heard and understood by the Colossian believers. And this was the, the truth that they embraced by faith. Let's keep reading in verse 6. It says this, The truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Now, one of the other things that we see here is that the gospel, the gospel-centered prayer also must include grace. Gospel-centered prayer must include grace. 
Uh, Paul actually reminds the believers in the Colossian church that the gospel actually was spreading all over the world. It's actually bearing fruit. It is growing. And so one of the things that was happening with the false teachers is it was actually restricting the growth of the church that the Colossians were experiencing some sort of like microcosm of the restriction of the gospel that you could argue was maybe like not natural, like the gospel was supposed to grow. And he's reminding them, hey, your, your local situation is actually a bit fairly unique. Don't be surprised. Like the gospel is actually still bearing fruit around the world. So he's kind of encouraging them to maintain hope that the gospel will bear fruit in their local context. Um, and hopefully that is also my encouragement to you this morning is that rest assured the gospel will bear fruit here in Davis, California. It will bear fruit even in your church. The gospel cannot be contained. <laughs> um, so right here, it's, it's very nice. One uh, Bible commentator, F.F. F. Bruce, he says that the whole gospel was actually going out into the whole world. And he's also encouraging the Colossians into their spiritual growth as well. F.F. F. Bruce says that they heard and believed the gospel the gospel told them of God's deep grace. The gospel told them how it brings them to Christ, how to surrender to Christ as their Lord and Savior, and also that the church itself seemed to be united by this experience of God's grace for them. And I loved that, united by their experience of God's grace for them. The gospel must, must, must include the grace of God and our prayers should also be centered on God's deep grace for us as well. Amen. Let's go ahead and keep reading verse 7 and 8 in Colossians chapter 1, and it says this. Sorry, I have my Bible so marked up that the 7 is covered up. <laughs> so, sorry. I've got, you, you can probably see I've got lots of like little underlines and highlighters and all sorts of things. So I'm going to read it from the back. I'm glad that I have that there. So just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Um, the next thing that gospel-centered prayer includes is love. Gospel-centered prayer must include love. Um, now, Epaphras is credited with founding the Colossian church. Most Bible scholars believe that he came to salvation under Paul's ministry when he was in Ephesus. It was the longest place that Paul had been in one particular place planting a church. Uh, Bible scholars estimate anywhere from two to three years that Paul was there. And so it's believed that Epaphras came to saving knowledge of God there, and he was maybe excited. He came back. He planted the church in Colossae. Um, and notice what it says about him, which I think is one of the most beautiful things that could be said of any Christian. He was a faithful minister, a faithful minister. Now, this church for a long time has had a very faithful minister. Um, Exeter has been here for a long, long, long time. And the the sort of reward for any pastor is not how big is your church. Like, I don't think God is going to ask any pastor, what was the size of your church? I think he's going to ask every pastor, how faithful were you at your church? And I believe that Exeter has been a very faithful minister. And my hope and my prayer for you guys is that you will also have another very faithful minister who comes into here next. Um, but this is a very instrumental. Epaphras was very instrumental in founding the church. He also founded churches close by in Heropolis and Laodicea in Colossians 4.13. And then notice how Paul actually closes this portion of the prayer. He says, he's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. He has made known to us your love in the Spirit. 
One of the things that I think is very beautiful about this is that Paul and Timothy, Paul is writing from a prison in Rome. He's under house arrest in Rome for approximately two years, and he is deeply encouraged by the love that this church has for one another. And I, I'll still, I still remember there's a couple of years ago that I had the opportunity of guest preaching at a little church down in Lompoc, California, Lomp- Lompoc, some people say it differently. Um, and when I was there, there was a family there that seemed like a bit out of place where I was like, hey, you guys seem like you would maybe be at a bigger church or a larger church. And how did you guys end up here? And I'll, I'll never forget what the man said. He, he was saying that a couple of years ago, they had about a 16-year-old son who had passed away. And they weren't involved in church at all during that time. And he told me, he was like, the people at this church loved me into this church. He's like, they just kept loving me. They just kept loving our family. They just kept serving our needs. Even when we weren't looking for it, even when we weren't asking for it, they just kept loving us. He's like, I don't have a reason to be anywhere else. Um, And I really loved that, and I hopefully want to encourage you today, like, you don't have to wait for your next pastor to be loving each other. Like, you can do that right now. Like, just because you don't have, like, the pastor in yet doesn't mean that your love for each other should stop. If anything, hopefully it will flourish and grow more and more. Like, that starts now. So there are things you can do now now while you are waiting. Um, So one of my prayers for you is that you guys would love each other with this deep sort of love that Christ has for you. Um, So we've seen a couple key elements of gospel-centered prayer, and the next thing that we're going to look at is that what gospel-centered prayer results in. So we're going to go to the second part of the prayer here in verse 9, and it says this, And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Gospel-centered prayer actually results in knowing God's will. Gospel-centered prayer results in knowing God's will. Um... Notice what what Paul doesn't say here about God's will. He doesn't say, seek visions for God's will for your life. He doesn't say, wait until you maybe hear like little voices that you might think might be God and that might be God's will for you. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say like cast lots and throw dice and if it's like a one, two, or three, that's, that's God's will for you. And if it's like a four, five, or six, then that's not God's will for you. He doesn't, he doesn't do that. But he uses this word filled, which translated in the Greek can also be translated as controlled by. Controlled by. He uses this same word in Ephesians 5, 18, where Paul writes to the believers and he says for them to be controlled by the Spirit, to be controlled by the Spirit. Well, how would we be controlled by the Spirit? Uh, One pastor and commentator, Warren Wearsby, says that it goes like this. He said, we are controlled by the Spirit, and we can understand the will of God primarily through the Word of God. We understand the will of God primarily through through the word of God. What, what happens a lot of times for us with God's will, I don't know if you've ever had this experience. So my, my wife and family, they're down in San Luis Obispo this weekend. It just kind of happened to work out that they're there. And then my son is on a youth group retreat. I think maybe with, is Grace on the youth group retreat? Yeah, yeah. so they're on the youth group retreat right now. Um, And so I have like beach things on my mind because they're down in San Luis Obispo and I got to see them playing on the beach through FaceTime, which was really nice. And so often when it comes to God's will, sometimes as Christians, we're like walking around, like, have you seen the guys with the metal detectors on the beach? Have you ever seen them? They're kind of, all right, okay, 
I, oh, 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 got a little metal there. Let me check. Okay, it's not that. Okay, right. And like we just kind of keep like floundering around thinking like maybe we'll strike rich and like, you know, find God's will. But it's a little less like walking around with a metal detector. And when you have God's word, it's more like he just gives you a treasure map. Like there's like specific steps that you can follow to find God's will. Um, and the nice thing about having the treasure map is that God can actually lead you to the right place in life where you can enjoy God, enjoy knowing him, enjoy experiencing the deep love of God at every single moment of your life. And this is available to you all the time. Now, in the New Testament, it actually gives several sort of explicit references to what God's will is. Um, I'm going to cover a few. There's actually more, but for sake of time, I'm, I'm only going to tackle a couple. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 4 teaches that it's God's will that all should be saved, that God desires for everyone to come to saving knowledge and repentance and redemption through his son. That is God's, what we could call his redemptive will. God's redemptive will. But it's also God's will in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, that all Christians would be sanctified, meaning that it's God's will that you would grow spiritually. That is God's will for you. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, this is God's will, your sanctification. Um, God's will is that you would actually be transformed by his grace and that you would grow spiritually, that you would kind of, what Ephesians talks about, put off the old man and put on the new man who's being renewed day by day in Christ, and that you would more and more and moment by moment surrender to God's abiding presence in your life for every aspect and every moment of your life. And the last thing that is mentioned or that all mentioned here is that it's God's will for you to do good. It's God's will for you to do good. In 1 Peter 2.15, he says, For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. The ignorance of foolish people. Now, again, you don't have to wait for a new pastor to start doing good. Did you know you can do that right now? You can start doing good to your brothers and sisters in this church now. That doesn't wait like until the new pastor comes. It's not going to be like, okay, start doing good. Guys, like you have the ability right now to do good towards one another. Um, and so those are some sort of general guidelines for God's will. Like, it's God's will that you would be saved. It's God's will that you would be sanctified. And it's God's will that you would do good. So when you're facing a specific situation, you can kind of ask yourself, do these things sort of line up with this? Does this line up to help me grow spiritually? Does this line up to help me mature? Does this line up to help me do more good for my brothers and sisters in Christ or do more good at my job or do more good for my family? Um, those are some sort of great aspects that you could ask. Uh, it's really nice. So the, in the Quaker tradition, they have this um, very interesting process of if you're not quite sure for God's will for your life and there's like a big decision that you make, they, they call what they is called a, a clarifying committee. So they'll have a few close friends come in and ask you about like a decision that you're thinking about making. And there's a pastor who's a, an author and writer, John Ortberg, he talks about this. And one of the things that he mentions is there was a seminary professor who was getting ready to accept being the president of the seminary. He was like, that sounds really nice, that sounds really good, but I just kind of want to make sure that this is going to be kind of God's will or God's plan for me. And as he sat around with his close friends, they started asking him a lot of questions. And they asked like, oh, so 
you'll be comfortable like not teaching your classes very much anymore. He's like, well, no, I, I love my students. I, I don't want to give, give up teaching. He's like, okay, well, you're, you're going to be doing like probably a lot of fundraising. Is that okay with you? He's like, I, I, that doesn't really sound that great to me. And so they're asking all these questions and it's kind of leaning towards like, actually it probably would be wise for this man not to be the president of the seminary. And one of the guys just asked him, so, so why do you want to be president? And he goes, well, I mean, I would have my name in the paper a lot. <laughs> and one of the guys sitting around him said, you know, John, I think there's other ways of getting your name in the paper than being the president. And he's like, yeah, you're right. And so the man actually did not end up accepting the role because he started realizing, you know what, this isn't going to be the best fit for, for me. Um, so usually you can also use wisdom and discretion of having close friends speak into your life to kind of clarify some of those things. Um, but the next thing he talks about here in verse 10 is this. He says, So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. The next thing that we'll see here is that gospel-centered prayer results in bearing fruit gospel-centered prayer results in bearing fruits. Now, it's very interesting. I don't know if any of you, has anyone ever walked before? Anyone ever walked? Just me? No? A lot of people walked? Yes. But the thing about walking is it's a steady, consistent pace. A steady, consistent pace. And so, what Paul and Timothy are talking about here is that the way that you bear fruit is having a steady, consistent walk with Jesus. That there's, there's no sort of like miracle, like magic pill that you take in five easy steps. Like it's a steady, regular walk with Christ. Um, and I don't know if you remember back to Genesis chapter 5 in verses 21 through 24. There's a man named Enoch that's listed there. Um, and in the chapter, it actually talks a lot about, like, everyone lived for, like, 500 years, and then they died. So it's like this theme of then they died, then they died, then they died. And then it gets to Enoch, and the thing that's said about Enoch is Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God for 300 years. You thought Exeter was the pastor here for a long time. So like... <laughs> For 300 years, and then the Bible says that God took him. As far as we know, Enoch did not actually die. Like, God actually took him away because he had such a close relationship with him. Um, but the word bearing here is written in the present tense in the Greek. So it's saying continually and consistently bear fruit. Continually and consistently bear fruit. Growing in this verse is also listed in the present tense, where it's saying actively grow in knowledge, like keep growing in your knowledge of God. Like that doesn't just happen on Sunday. It actually happens throughout the rest of the week too. But there's this sort of habitual action of spending time with God. Um, now, I, I grew up in the Midwest in Kansas City, and I grew up in a very conservative Baptist church there. And one of, one of the things that like a lot of the pastors or youth pastors would always come up and say like, I'm embellishing a little bit, but they'd be like, hey, Sonny, how's your walk? How's your walk going today? I mean, I walk just fine. What do you mean exactly by that? I'm more of a literal person. Um, but as you may know, they meant your spiritual walk. How is your spiritual walk going with Christ? And I really appreciate that question because it's more of an evaluative question. It's more of like an assessment that you can do at any time and that I'll even ask you this morning, right now, this week, how is your walk with Christ? If it's off, now is a good time to kind of come back and reset and restart and walk with Christ this week. But how is your walk? How is your walk with Jesus, not just here, but in every aspect of life? How is your walk with God with your finances? How is your walk with God with your relationships? How is your walk with God with your kids? How is your walk with God with your job, with your community? 
you can evaluate your walk with God not just simply by how you're spending time in the word. Yes, it is that, but how is that impacting your life for other people as well? Um, now, so, I don't know, the, what's, what's the interim pastor's name? What is Patrick. Pa- Patrick, okay. So I've, I've heard Patrick preach before, actually, up at a church in Hydesville, California. And it, up in Hydesville, there was this lumberjacky guy who cut down huge redwood trees, and um, he would always get the little daily bread devotional things. Have you guys ever seen those? Are you familiar with those? I, I see some heads nodding like, yes, we have them. Um, and often what happens with us as Christians is, you know, well, we might read a Bible verse or kind of like pray for like a day, and then we kind of sometimes might drift away for a few days and then maybe think about that old Bible verse too. Um, but a lot of times we are walking around with, and what he would call it like when the daily breads didn't get replenished there when they didn't have the next month he would go up to the pastor and say hey you've got some stale bread here (laughs) 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 but that's kind of often what we do some of us are living on stale bread we're living on some some things that we've learned before in the past and um i don't know if you has anybody ever been to costco i like going to costco um I know it's a little bit of a trek for you Davis folks to come over to Woodland to get the Costco. Uh, but at Costco, they have these things. It's like non-breads. Have you seen these? It's like a little package of non-breads. Um, and when we take non-bread out of the oven and it is warm and fresh and like you just like peel it, it just feels like a goodness for your soul. And that's kind of like what it is when you're taking in the word of God fresh every day versus eating stale bread. Um, We need the word of God every single day to bear fruit in our lives. Um, The next thing that we'll see here Um, we'll go ahead and read down in verse 11, is this. It says, Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. The next thing that we see for the results of gospel-centered prayer is we need spiritual power. Gospel-centered prayer results in spiritual power. Now, this is also, again, it's written in the present tense. So this means to be continually filled with the spiritual power of God's word. The word that Paul uses here for strengthened will sound familiar to you because he uses it elsewhere in Philippians 4.13. And that's the verse where we get, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So spiritual strength is actually available to you on a daily basis, on a moment-by-moment basis. And guess where the supply is coming from? The supply is not just coming from your need in the moment. Did you notice what it says here? According to his glorious might. His glorious might. That the available strength to you isn't just what you need. It's an overabundance of God's strength. And this verse is translated a little bit more literally where it says the might of his glory. It is the might of his glory. Now, I don't know what the might of God's glory looks like. I have this sort of cartoon imagination in my mind of like God really flexing his muscles and being like super strong. I don't know that that's exactly what what this is talking about, but it's that sort of spiritual strength that God has. And what, what is the might of God's glory? What is the might of God's glory? Romans 6, 4 says this. Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father so that we too might walk in newness of life. 
the type of spiritual strength that is available to you through God and his word is resurrection power strength. It is you are dead, now you're alive. You were lost, now you are found. You were without hope, now you have hope. You were without love, now you have the deepest amount of love that could ever be bestowed on someone. This is the type of strength that is available to you, Christian. And gospel-centered prayer does not just result in these things, but it also produces something as well. Gospel-centered prayer produces a gospel-centered life, a life that is centered on God, anchored on God, rooted on God, and dwells with inside of God. And we'll close very quickly here just with these final verses. Colossians 12 through 14 says this. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of of sins. Paul and Timothy use the word qualified here. This is an instant qualification for the person who is saved. You are instantly qualified. The inheritance that he's talking about here is not just future heavenly inheritance. It's actually inheritance now and here. Usually we think of inheritance as waiting to die and then you receive your inheritance. But notice that he's saying that Um, that you will share in the inheritance of the saints of light. And he's talking more active, that you are delivered from the domain of darkness to the domain of the kingdom of his beloved son. It's because of Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection, that you can have redemption and forgiveness of sins. For you, Christian, you have redemption. Not only do you have redemption and forgiveness of your sins, I would argue you even have something greater than that. You have the love of God poured out to you through Jesus Christ. And when you have the love of Jesus Christ, what else could you need? You have everything you need in the love of Christ. And what could be better than that? There is nothing better than the love of Christ for you. And it's with that that we'll close in prayer. God, we just thank you for this loving day. And deacons, if you want to go ahead and come forward. God, we thank you for the love that you have poured out for us through Christ. God, I pray that you would empower this church with just gospel-centered, gospel-saturated prayer that is filled with love and truth and grace that you would produce and form in this church more and more of your spirit, that they would look more and more like Christ, that there actually is a, a kingdom of darkness here, now, even in Davis, and that more and more of your sons and daughters need to experience the love of Jesus and come to saving faith. And I pray that this church will be a bold gospel witness here, that you will draw people here to find out about the love that Jesus has for them. Now, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I want you to just kind of go ahead and pray with me for a moment. If you've never surrendered your life to Christ and you maybe feel that sort of what I'll call Holy Spirit nudge on you right now, um, I would argue that's God speaking to you. And all you need to do is very simple. It can just go like this. There's no perfect way to do this. You can just say, Jesus... I give you my life. My life for your life. 
Forgive me of my sins. Help me that it would be no longer I who live, but from this moment, this day forward, it would be Christ living in me, the love of Christ living in me, the hope of glory living in me. And may God seal you, and may you follow him for the rest of your days. If you prayed that prayer right now, we have the deacons who are, are up here. If you need any sort of um, additional prayer or just feeling like, hey, I need to get more involved in this church, I would encourage you guys to come forward this morning um, during this time of invitation.